First of all, I'd just like to thank all of you for these awesome three days so far. It's been so heartwarming for me to see so many of you come out to, uh, you know, the last three nights to spend this time with our Lord, to adore Him, to worship Him. It really shows uh, to the great fervor of your faith and your devotion. So just, you know, as a priest, thank you so much. It's so heartwarming and so awesome uh, to see and to be a part of and to worship with you during these last 40 hours. On our first day, we talked about commitment. We talked about how when Jesus called his disciples, he was looking for absolute commitment to be all in, that he didn't show them the grand plan for their life and how everything was going to unfold. He said, follow me, and then the rest would end up being unpacked over the rest of their lives, and that God is calling us to that same kind of commitment that we are called to be all in, to hold nothing back from him. On day two, we talked about listening, and we reflected on Samuel, how he heard God's voice at night, but he didn't recognize that it was God's voice, at least not at first, that he kept going to his mentor. He kept going to Eli, and then Eli said, hey, next time you hear it, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, that he was hearing God's voice, but yet he wasn't familiar enough with God to know and to recognize that it was his voice. And so he spent time with him, got to know the Lord, and then was able to respond to his will, and that us too, there are thousands, millions of voices and distractions out there, and it can be hard to kind of figure out or discern, well, which one is God's? And we talked about the importance of actually spending time with our Lord so that we can learn to recognize his voice among all the other crazy sounds and distractions that are out there. So day one was commitment, day two was listening, Today, we're focused on action, that we can't just commit in our head. We can't just only listen, that God ultimately does call us to action, an action that is ultimately going to take his strength. We need to rely on his strength and not our own. Yesterday, after daily Mass, uh, one of the sisters who comes to Mass at our parish approached, approached me and said, Father, I'm really sorry to ask this of you, but uh, do you have jumper cables in your car? My car battery's dead. Now, little did she know, my superpower is killing car batteries. I am surprised that Guinness Book of World Records has not called me yet because I have a talent for killing batteries, which does mean I have a, um, a lot of practice jumping cars because of that. Um, so much so that I begged my dad for Christmas a couple years ago, can you just please get me one of those battery packs so I don't have to keep humiliating myself uh, all over the place asking random people to jump my car. He obliged, and I got it, and I was so happy. It was one of my favorite gifts ever, because I was like, thankful, thank gosh, thank God. Now I don't have to do this anymore. So I put it in my car, and a week later, after Christmas, I left my headlights on for the millionth time, and the car was dead. There was one problem. That battery pack was still in the box. I never charged it. So a lot of good that was going to do me. Uh, So I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I finally got this gift. I never charged the thing. And guess what? I had to find somebody to help jump my car. It's a great gift. Ton of potential. Great idea. Totally useless without charge. This is an expensive, you know, paperweight. My friends, that's what we are like without him. We have tons of potential. God created us with a whole bunch of talents. And he has a great plan for each and every one of us. But without him to charge us up, without his power, without his strength, we're really nothing. It's so easy in our world today to just try to fit God into our life. All right, God, like you're one thing among many. Like, how can I fit you in? It's nice to have you in my life. I appreciate it. But the thing is, Jesus doesn't ask to be a part of our life. He asks to be at the absolute center of it. And the devil knows that, okay, maybe I can convince people to just not worry about Jesus at all. Maybe they just cast him off, and some will do that. But he can't convince all of us. So he's like, okay, if I can't get them to totally just reject Jesus, maybe I can get them to just make Jesus one thing among many, rather than being at the absolute core, rather than being at the absolute center. I think of it this way. Like, if this is Jesus, if this is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, if this is the king of the universe on this altar, then there is absolutely nothing and no one more important than our Lord right here and right now. Or, this is just a piece of bread 
in a fancy container, and it's really of no importance whatsoever. So either our faith or our Lord is of ultimate importance or of no importance whatsoever. The only thing our faith can't be is of moderate importance. And yet that's the temptation that we all face to some degree to just make Jesus, you know, one person, one thing among the many in our life. But he doesn't ask to be just one thing among many. He asks to be the center of it. And we need him to be the center of it. It's not just important that he's at the center. It's essential that he's at the center. Because you all know this. This life is hard. It is not easy to go through. I remember, you know, in seminary we study philosophy. And, you know, we read a whole bunch of philosophers. And there was one quote from a philosopher that really stuck out to me. He said this. He said, life will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. It ain't about how hard you hit, but about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Some of you are smiling. You know this philosopher. That is Rocky Balboa. And uh, despite going to seminary in Philly, we didn't study him in class, but I am very adamant about my furthering my education, so I studied up on him. But in case you don't buy into what he says, Jesus says it too. He says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Not every once in a while, not most of the time, every single day. And that cross, that was the sign of like ultimate torture, pain, suffering, death. It wasn't just the minor inconvenience of someone cutting you off or getting stuck at the red light too long. This was a form of torture that the Romans didn't even let their own people go through. This, being willing to suffer, this is what the Lord says we have to do if we want to follow him. And I was just listening to... um, a homily by St. John Vianney, actually this morning, believe it or not, and he was talking about the danger of not feeling tempted, not feeling persecuted, because we think of suffering, and I think we oftentimes think of it as out there, but the most powerful person that's oppressing us is the evil one, is the devil, because he wants our soul, and he'll stop at nothing in order to get it, and St. John Vianney says this, paraphrasing, if we're not feeling tempted, if we're not feeling attacked, he said we should probably be worried that, ju- that might just mean the devil's happy where we're at. Like, oh, Father Josh is doing this. Like, well, I'll just leave him. Leave him go. I like what he's doing. I'm not going to bother him. And yet, it's the saints that the devil attacks the most because he, that's, those are the ones he doesn't have. And so if we really do want to go all in, if we really do want to follow Jesus with our whole heart and we commit to that, we should prepare for suffering. Suffering is a given. There's no way around it. But God's grace is a given too. I think we see that very beautifully in our reading uh, tonight. It's from the man in the desert. For those of you who maybe don't understand where it fits into the context of everything, remember that the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt and through Moses God freed them. And now they're wandering in the desert and they're hungry. And they ask the Lord for food. And he says he's going to send them quail. And he's going to send them this stuff called manna for them to eat. And that's what we heard from today. And in this, our Lord is preparing us for what we see on the altar right now, for the Eucharist. For starters, that word manna actually means, what is this? And when we look upon the Eucharist, we, in a sense, say, what is this? Or rather, we say, who is this? The man and the quail, it was a daily miracle for 40 years. They were in the desert, the wilderness, for 40 years. We're fed by the Lord with this manna. Every time we gather here for Mass, each and every day, we're fed by a daily miracle. The quail and the manna was called the bread and the flesh from heaven. Upon the altar right now, we have the true bread from heaven. The flesh and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what they did with the extra manna? They put it in the Holy of Holies. They put it in the Ark of the Covenant. We have tabernacles. And probably my famous one, or my fa- rather my favorite one, is once they got to the promised land, the manna stopped. It did its job. It got them to their destination. It was their food for the journey. This is our food for the journey. This is where we get our strength so that we can arrive at the promised land of heaven. This is the great gift that we have before us today. The Eucharist, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the altar. And in a very real way in the Eucharist, God is actually obedient to man. 
Think about that. In the Eucharist, God is, in a sense, obedient to man. That at the words of the priest, when he says, this is my body, this is my blood, that bread and wine is no longer bread and wine. It's the body and blood of our Lord at the priest's words. When we come here in adoration, he's on the altar for us. We place him there. He allows us to put him there. When we gather here in this church, in the tabernacle, he's there because we placed him there. You know, man's supposed to be obedient to God. And yet, in his humility, God, in a sense, becomes obedient to us so that we will spend time with him, so that we will get to know him and allow him to shower us with his love, with his mercy, with his truth, with his power. Let us never get numb to who is on this altar right in front of us, right here, right now, and every single day, that this is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords. This is the creator of the universe. This is our teacher. This is our master. This is our friend. This is our God.